Admittedly, there are confusions and incorrect assumptions about value-added tax that often arise. The fundamental system behind the value-added tax law and the entire calculation is fairly straightforward. And once you've understood the basic principles, the whole thing isn't that difficult anymore. That's why we're going to take a detailed look at it now. One point only, value-added tax and sales tax are exactly the same. In general language usage and also in the press, value-added tax is very frequently referred to. The legally correct term is the VAT, but there are also no differences, it's simply exactly the same. This means everything I'm explaining now about value-added tax applies to sales tax. It's just a different term for the same thing. In Germany, we fundamentally have two distinct tax rates and there are also certain sales that are exempted from taxes. That means actually you can remember that there are three possibilities for how high your value-added tax could be. However, I would like to mention here for completeness sake that there are a few exceptions where this is different. In the agricultural sector, there are some peculiarities where the value-added tax rates are different. But for example, if you are in the buying and selling of used items, there is also something called differential taxation. Even there, the value-added tax is calculated a little differently. But let's assume the very classic and honestly in practice 99% of the very normal cases, then we are talking normally about your service having a price and you have to add a certain value-added tax rate to it. And the standard case in Germany is 19%. This implies that in the absence of any exceptions, you are obligated to consistently compute the value of your services or products by applying a 19% value-added tax. The initial classification of exceptions pertains to the reduced tax rate. These are sales where the legislator has said they should be particularly promoted. This is for example in the area of food. The majority of foods possess a 7% value-added tax, which renders them slightly more affordable for the ultimate consumer. Another example is in the field of education, such as books, magazines, or cultural items like museum or theater tickets, all of which have a 7% tax rate. All of the items are listed in the law as well. I will simply mention a few of them here. The list is definitely too lengthy to enumerate at this moment. But this is the category where you have to charge 7% value-added tax. And then there is a second category of special cases, namely the tax-exempt sales. These are sales where the state wants to avoid them being unnecessarily expensive. That means very often it's already about the existential area, so to speak. Like, for example, your private living space, your rent that you pay to your landlord, is exempt from value-added tax. Your landlord is naturally somewhat like an entrepreneur, but he also does not show any value-added tax in the rental agreement, because that is clearly regulated in the value-added tax law. But also revenues from healthcare professions, including most revenues from doctors, are exempt from value-added tax. But also other revenues, such as sales related to insurance. That means if I am an insurance agent, then my sales are usually tax-exempt as well. I'll also just add a few more tax-exempt sales here. These are sales where you do not have to pay any tax. In the majority of cases, you also do not have the right to deduct input tax on the other side of the transaction. For instance, in the hypothetical scenario where I work as a midwife, my sales would be exempt from taxes. However, this also means that I cannot claim the value added tax that I have paid to my service providers and suppliers. That means for a whole lot of sales that are tax exempt, it results in me not being able to claim any value added tax on the other side and not having those benefits that others have who charge value added tax. The most common mistake that happens in the context of value added tax is confusing gross and net. And I'll explain this using an example because many people think they have to pay 19% value added tax on an invoice amount. However, that's not quite right. Let's assume you provide a consulting service that incurs a cost. Now, you generate an invoice and of course add the 19% on top of your price as that is the payment for your work and covers the expenses involved. That means you don't just somehow reduce your performance, but you start with your price, which is the net price, that's yours, that's basically the nice part of the price. The net price, that's what you receive and then you take the value added tax rate, which you add on top, in most cases 19%. That means you perform calculations on your invoice by adding 19% value added tax, which amounts to 190. This results in a gross amount of 190, and that is also the price you receive from the customers without any deductions or additional charges. Of course, you don't keep those 190, you then remit them to the tax office, and they end up staying in your pocket in the end. However, 
If we want to calculate the value added tax rate from the gross price now, it's not 19% because we're talking about the euro 190 here and the gross price is, that means we calculate to get the value added tax from the gross price 190 divided by, and that's approximately 15.9%. That means with a full tax rate of 19%, the percentage of the gross price is approximately 15.9%. By the way, it's wrong when MediaMarkt claims to give you VAT as a gift and simply reduces the price by 19%. MediaMarkt can't waive this VAT for you. They reduce the price by 19%, which is incorrect, as the correct amount would be 15.9% since they're reducing the price from the gross amount. As a self-employed individual, you should always get into the habit of calculating only with net prices, both for your prices and your purchases, because the value added tax immediately goes to the tax office anyway. It's just a pass-through item that you don't benefit from at all. So if you have this consulting service, you just add those 190 euros. They don't matter at all. The same naturally applies to your purchases as well. When you buy a new smartphone, the gross price that you actually want to pay in the store or online shop is completely irrelevant. More interesting for accounting is always the net price because you will get that value added tax back from the tax office anyway. Now I've talked so much about how you have to pay value added tax, remit it and can reclaim it, etc. However, how does it actually work? What do we actually do while we do accounting? And that is quite interesting. You include value added tax in all your invoices. That means a portion of the money you receive from your customers is always the value added tax that you have written into your invoices. In the example of consulting sales net, that's the 190 value added tax and this money you will receive from your customer. However, you not only have value added tax on the revenue side, but also on the expenditure side. For all of your expenses, like a brand new smartphone, train tickets, perhaps a car that you purchase, a home office, you have specific costs that you can potentially deduct and so on. All of the costs that you have, there is also value added tax included in the majority of invoices. Regardless of location, you always have an invoice. This is also crucial because you require an accurate invoice to factor in the value added tax when calculating. And all of these amounts that you pay to others, you also calculate and include them in the total sum that you add up. The term for this value added tax that you have paid is input tax. So you actually have two pots. Once the pot of value added tax that you have received from your customers and once the outgoing value added tax, which is called input tax. Then you compute this value added tax amount minus the input tax amount and transfer this difference to the tax office. This is subsequently considered as your value added tax liability. What can be natural, particularly when you are faced with higher costs that exceed your income. However, even if you make an investment now, for example, it is highly likely that the input tax amount will be higher than the output tax amount. This always leads to the tax office actually transferring this particular amount to you. And this whole calculation, so the value added tax minus the input tax, is then the tax liability or the refund claim. Honestly, that's the reason why you do your accounting. That is almost the only reason why one should somehow continue to do their accounting precisely for these reports. And you have to do all of this for specific predefinitions, time periods. And that varies a bit. There is a possibility to do this monthly, quarterly, or even just once a year. Then you always do this for that period, calculate the value added tax, the input tax, etc. But you can't choose that because your frequency depends on how high the value added tax liability was last year. This means the tax office goes there, examines the tax liability for the past year, and then determines your advance return frequency based on that. If your tax liability was below throughout the entire last year, then it is completely sufficient for the tax office if you do it once a year. That means you calculate the value added tax minus the input tax for the entire calendar year as part of the annual value added tax return. If the total value added tax liability for the last year was between and, then you must do the fund registration, which is the whole calculation I mentioned, on a quarterly basis, for example, for the second quarter, for the months of April, May, and June. That means you add up all the sales, all the expenses for these months, and then you have the tax liability or a refund claim. And you do that once per quarter. If the tax liability was surpassed in the previous year, then you need to handle it on a monthly basis to ensure compliance. That means then you go there once a month, calculate the whole thing and transfer the corresponding amount or get it refunded. That's essentially how the entire value added tax pre-registration works. 
Just because you file monthly or quarterly VAT pre-registration doesn't mean you don't have to also file an annual VAT return. You must always do this. The very attentive among you will now think for a moment, when I do monthly value-added tax pre-registrations, that means I record all my sales and expenses for each month and the corresponding value-added tax, of course, and report it to the tax office and transfer the amount or get it refunded. What happens then if I do this for the whole year now? Then every sale and every expense has already been recorded once. And you are absolutely right about that. If you've worked 100% cleanly all year, always declared all income and expenses and recorded them correctly, the annual VAT return isn't a big deal anymore. This is once again a summary message for the whole year and then there will be no additional payment or refund in the annual value added tax return. In practice though, you may forget an invoice on the left or right or initially forget the gas receipt in the glove compartment and then you still have the chance to include them in the annual declaration. However, one can always tell from the yearly VAT return how accurately work was done throughout the year. Record all revenues and expenses on an ongoing basis to avoid stress with the annual value added tax return. I strongly recommend it to you for ideal financial management. I am aware that it was a considerable amount of information all at once. However, I trust that it provided you with a slightly improved understanding of what you are consistently calculating in your accounting program and the fundamental concept behind this entire value added tax regulation. If you have any additional questions, I strongly encourage you to simply ask a question below this video and I will be more than happy to assist you further. And if there are many questions, I would be happy to do another Q&A video specifically addressing these questions. However, I can also imagine that you might be thinking now that this is a lot of work and unfortunately it doesn't handle itself. And I totally agree with you on that. You can find all the information about our services and how we can help you exactly by clicking here. But you can of course get to know us a little better by watching the other videos first on this channel, for example, this one or this one.